Hello, everybody, and welcome to this, the eighth installment of the Psychology of Lockdown series. I'm joined once again by Join Roche of the, of the Line International out of Canada. Uh, we have been discussing the concept of mystification as, uh, as described by psychoanalyst John Bradshaw. We're on the seventh characteristic today. Uh, it is called Identity, Trance, and Confusion, and I'm looking forward to this one. I did want to mention, and maybe George and I can talk about this a little bit, uh, I just produced uh, an episode of The Shift, number 69, with Donald Jeffries about bullying, because a lot of times we talk about, I mean, all of this is from family systems therapy, and we talk about how the government uh, is essentially uh, acting as an abusive father psychologically. And so many of us then have these characteristics of mystification as a result. In that episode 69, uh, we really get into the bullying culture and how it starts uh, through public education and how the social um, the social hierarchies that are created in public schools and in schools in general uh, really add and create the kind of trauma that George and I are talking about. So uh, that one would be uh, good to check out if you're interested in these concepts. It really lays a foundation uh, as to where these trauma bonds come from and uh, why mystification works the way it does and how so many people then later in life uh, never really heal that wounded inner child from the emotional abuse they endured as children. And then they are uh, open to getting triggered into these states of mystification uh, and abuse by authority figures. So George, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. And let's get into identity trance and confusion. Absolutely. Thanks again, Doug, for having me here on the shift. Um, we've certainly nestled into this stuff uh, pretty quickly. You've you've caught on very fast over these past seven. It's good stuff. Uh, good stuff. Um, what's really striking to me as we were talking before the show is really to, to when I'm having conversations with others now, I'm starting to really have some empathy and compassion for the emotional trauma that causes them to ignore when I post a scientific study or I post, uh, you know, something from the CDC website or the World Health Organization and they just, you know, it doesn't conform to the lockdown narrative. So they're just like, oh, you're just a crazy person. It's like, well, OK, I see. Now I'm like, I'll respond. I see that I've triggered you. You know, <laughs> I <Once>, understand. <laughs> well, this is it. This is the interpersonal bridge you speak of. Once we can level this playing field and stop, you know, the attacking. Mm -hmm. That people can just accept that everybody is limited, much of which is by design. Not everybody sees the same things the same way. So it's important to reinstall that compassion. Again, I don't want to confuse this with confronting. Confronting is an act of telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to not allow people who wish to enforce what we know to be uh, false belief systems on us. It's always important to challenge those while we respect the limitations of this person who we perceive as not knowing as much as we do. So a lot of our position does have the propensity toward a little bit of arrogance, which we must acknowledge. Yeah. However, the intention is not to be arrogant. The intention is to be accurate. Right. And accuracy comes from digesting information that makes sense that is a common practice, and it is supported by, uh, by information that is commonly known as reliable, that's backed by science. Unfortunately, when we see a lot of the debates going on, not only is science absent, but logic, logical understanding of the other person's view of the world. And in the absence of the true forms of necessary information and logic, Judgment should be the last thing that comes into play mm -hmm. ever, but it's very frequent and very common that it does because people who are generally not accepting of their own shortcomings will be quick to judge others, which is really a reflection of their own denied limitations. Right. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up. And, and one of the things I've said uh, in this series before, but I'll say it again, is that I'm not really trying to argue because we definitely come across and you and I are both uh, anti-lockdown. We think they do more harm than good. Um, 
And so we can come across as being arrogant about these perspectives, but it's not about being right for me. It's about having respecting other people's opinions and having a rational conversation where alternative narratives are accepted without being called a crazy person or without being shamed. I mean, that's what I'm asking for out of this series. I hope people can listen to it. Maybe they don't suddenly stop believing in the lockdowns, but at least they can have a rational conversation and respect somebody that has a different opinion than themselves. Well, because th absolutely. Absolutely. You mm -hmm. see, when you talk about being right, people who are addicted to being right or more interested in being right receive very little information about, uh, you know, how to change their belief systems about who they are. When a person is wanting to be right there, they want to control the conversation. So how can new information come into the uh, into practice? You have a person who's stifling its flow because they want to take up too much room by seeking to be right. I think it's always better to take the objective stance, drop your own frame of reference, listen to what the other person is saying, be willing to do that, mm -hmm. and be willing to use, you know, what Carl Rogers called called active and passive listening. What I hear you saying, Jack, is like, like get the agreement from the other person about what you're saying before you respond. So they, right. th so that you, you show that you've understood, you've listened. I tell people to listen with their eyes, not just with their ears. Like really <clears throat> plug into the, uh, what, what the other person is trying to convey to you. All too often, people are thinking of what to say next rather than hearing what's actually being said to them yeah. in real time. So they're not focused on what the other person is saying. And all too often, the responses collide. So I think it's important to keep that voltage of connectivity going on, especially with the subject matter we're having to deal with today. Yeah. It is vital that people pay attention to some of these very important and very nutritious ide ideas about how to stay connected with the person with whom you are communicating or with whom you are aiming your views at. Let's not assume we are absolutely right. Nobody should, not even the experts. Science is a debatable subject matter. It right. is not in a final form. So if it's not in a final form, that means it's open for debate. Now people just have to learn how to debate respectfully. Exactly, exactly. I do want to reiterate something that you mentioned just a few minutes ago, and this is the idea of, of uh, not, not being passive in your own sense of perspective and being able to set up really solid boundaries for yourself. Because I, I have made the mistake in the past, and I had to learn this lesson the hard way in personal relationships, where I just wanted to become such an incredible listener. And listening, of course, is super important. I mean, I get that. But I wanted to listen to other people's perspectives. And, um, and but then I wouldn't set up a, a solid personal boundary where I'd say, you know, hey, you've entered my emotional space. And now I'm going to say that's enough is enough. I'm going to protect myself. Um, and I think this is also a common problem, especially as you're learning these listening skills, right? <laughs> know how to listen, but also know how to have respectful boundaries so you don't become the target of emotional abuse and manipulation. Well, this is the thing, and people need to understand the benefit by reinstalling your boundaries. Boundaries that were collapsed and abolished back in childhood need to be resurrected in order for that person to be a growing individual. Mm -hmm. If people don't understand limits, then it's kind of like a sense of lawlessness. But I do believe that boundaries need to be permeable. That is, I know what to let in, and I know what to keep out. And other people, well, the job of of that person with the permeable, uh, permeable boundaries is to teach others how to treat them. Mm -hmm. We have to teach people how to treat us. They don't just get to do whatever they want, say whatever they want to us. We have to teach people about how to treat us. That is called self-respect. Right. I respect myself enough to not allow myself to be surrounded with toxic people. Uh, you know, people who ge generally flaunt uh, their knowledge as weapons, not as something to be uh, uh, shared. Uh, who, you know, kind of want to beat you over the head with it. They want to force you into, you know, believing what they believe. There's no conversation really occurring. What you have is a person who is preparing to be an attack dog. We, we got to stop this stuff. It's very confusing when we already have the confusion to deal with. And they want us divided. Let's face it. This part of the plan that we're seeing today is deliberate division. When the investors see that, there's division, they know that the plan is succeeding. Right. This is the last time in our history, uh, if ever there were a time for unity, it's now.
because our way of life is being squashed. And this is triggering childhood for everybody to some degree, known or unknown. When we're talking about identity, trance, and confusion, it's all here. All of it. Mm. Even the identity of our own countries are, are placed in question and jeopardy under the terms and conditions we're being made to live under right now. You know, one of the things, talking about identity, one of the things that I've really been um, just thinking about quite a bit lately is how much people identify, they identify with certain groups, um, but they certainly identify in politics with the left or the right. I mean, we're always complaining about the left-right paradigm to try to get people to break out of these molds because absolutely, once they identify as Republican or Democrat here in the United States, I mean, I've seen so many people that have just separated themselves from their own ability to critically think and just believed whatever the the democrat party line is or the republican party line we have this i always say it i'm no trump supporter or whatever i i could care less about that whole political theater scene but i've i've seen this what what's being called trump derangement syndrome where essentially anything that trump said was just wrong and then all critical yeah. thinking is out the window. I mean, when, you know, hydroxychloroquine is something I've covered extensively on the show. In all the countries that use hydroxychloroquine, of which there are entire nation states that have decided to use that to combat COVID, and, um, and their fatality rates are way down, way down. You know, their hospitalization rates are down. It's, it's, you can see it. It's a, a rational point of view to think that maybe we should be you know, contemplating using this or at least allowing individuals to make the choice for themselves if they want to use it uh, when it comes to how they treat themselves and their health in terms of this COVID virus. Um, But I've seen number of people, people that on one at the top of the thread will say I'm scientifically illiterate, and then I'll post all the science that backs hydroxychloroquine use, and then at the end say, well, those scientists were just ideologically motivated by Trump to manufacture some fake science and it's just like okay how did they turn off their critical thinking where they uh, clearly they believe in the scientific process but if a peer-reviewed paper says something that trump said then it must be wrong well (laughs) it seems pretty sketchy to think like that it seems biased yeah um it's certainly unfair uh, I think it expresses the uh, depth of disdain that some people have for Trump, which I think is completely out of proportion to anything being discussed. Uh, again, I think it's very suspect when you see all or nothing yeah, going on definitely. in the mix. It's all or nothing. Yeah. Uh, when that's happening, you know you've got polarized thinking at the helm. Uh, That's an illusion that's manufactured from a person's imagination. That's not something that's going to be tested in reality. This is a a person really trying to vent, trying to get the most out of their vitriol, vitriolic mentality Mm -hmm. toward Trump. I mean, I understand there's the haters and people are going to hate. We can't simply do away with it by forbidding it. That's for sure. But I think the conditioning of a lot of these people is such that they carry disdain already within their hearts and within their minds. And Trump is just merely another canvas for them to play that garbage out onto. I don't see how it's rational to try to make the worst of any one person agreeing or not agreeing is, is not, is not the basis either. You know, like, Oh, you, you got to agree with me. I said that Trump is a, a POS. Okay. Well, that's a matter of opinion. It should not be a point of debate. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, well, yet, and yet we see this going on all over the place. Yeah. And who cares? I, I said, we said before, left, right, it doesn't matter. G- just give us free uh, and, and fair elections. That's what, that's, what we're, that's what we want. Whether you're left, right, center, above, below, beyond, underneath, who cares? Mm-hmm. Well, and this is just where it comes in that once someone has identified with the left or the right side of the paradigm, then suddenly they're not involved in in 
the in, in the rational conversation any anymore. They're not talking nope. about the issue. They're just and they're not going to change their mind. You know, no. Well, someone on the right said this, so I automatically disagree. Or someone on the left said this, and I automatically disagree. And it's just a way of entering into that trance-like state and then and being <laughs> triggered into just enforcing a perspective without really engaging in the rational conversation at hand. It's, it's frustrating to deal with. <laughs> it, it, it is, it is because what's happening is people are not, you know, they're the, sorry, they're attacking the person, not the problem. Mm. You see, when you know a lot about the problem, then you spend time talking about the problem. But when you don't know a lot about the problem, you do what these people are doing on Facebook and you start attacking the guy, right? The girl. Whoever's communicating, you're not attacking the issue because you don't know enough about the issue to attack it. So the only thing left for you to do is to attack me, the person. Well, that's not a debate. That just resembles some kind of war you want to wage with somebody. You're not getting anywhere. There's no learning value there whatsoever. So when people know the issues, they discuss the issues. When they don't know the issues, they attack you. It's a way for them to feel better about themselves, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're attacking somebody, I said before, attacking skills are lacking. Uh, you know, where, where there's a strong debate and there's strong uh, respect for the information and the knowledge. And the, the aim is to get to clarity, to get to the bottom of things, to get to the truth in matters. When that's the journey, hey, you can talk with people all day long. But the moment you go off the rails of that aim, the aim is no longer authentic. Mm -hmm. It's about a personal attack. <laughs> we got to stop this garbage from permeating people's conversations. It causes a lot of confusion. As I said before, right. It's too confusing already. We don't need people adding further unenlightenment to the world. Well, I mean that, and that's exactly right. And so let's, let's like solidify this, these three notions, identity, trance and confusion because we're all it's we're dealing okay. with a lot of complex subject matter we all know that one plus one equals two it doesn't matter if if trump says that let's, or somebody else you know um, let's make it simpler Let, let's make it simple because again we we don't want to complexify the people are already seeing this they just don't know how to name it so so yeah. let's make it clear when you come from a family who orchestrates life so that you get to be who you are there is no need for trances or confusion. You're in one piece. The mind, the body, right. and the spirit all line up. Okay? When you come from a family or a history where life is orchestrated so that you do not get to be who you are, <clears throat> excuse me, naturally, your identity is brought into question. You have to go into a trance because to be who you are isn't acceptable. Yeah. This is very confusing. So that's why they're in order. The confusion is the last item on the deselfment agenda. Identity. Now, if you remove the word trance, you have identity confusion. The trance is the state of mind. Mm-hmm. The identity is who you are. And the confusion about that is caused when you're not accepted, when you're not given permission to be who you are. Or you're gaslit. You see right. things going on in the home. You know it ain't good. You bring it up. Mama, what's going on here? Oh, nothing. It's just nothing. Don't worry about it. Mind your own business. Yeah. Well, I could have sworn I heard some ruckus going on. You see? Where there's high levels of stress and violence in families, it's very common that people get the message that, hey, don't be who you are. You be what we want you to be. You do what we tell you. Do what you're told. Is it, I mean, this is the oldest, you know, do what you're told. These four words have echoed around the world. Obedience. People have been trained in obedience from the earliest of ages. So if you are to yeah. obey, all the time. That means you are also to obey how you and who you should be. 
There's not one person that doesn't have identity confusion when they come from a family upbringing that does not give you permission to be fully who you are, that the way you are is okay. Mm -hmm. We accept you in the condition that you are in. Now, since those expectations are unrealistic, you can't be anybody else other than who you are, hence the confusion. This places a significant amount of stress on a person to measure up and the unrealistic expectation cannot possibly be met. This is deeply shaming to a child. Right. And later the adult who continues to obey these mystifying expectations. So when I don't get to be the I am who I am, meaning me, I do me for that I came, the poet says. When I don't get to do me, and you expect me to do you, I lose conscious contact with who my authentic core nature is. Right. Now I develop a false self. Because the shame that is inherent in this kind of treatment is so painful that people over time that they have remained loyal to the family system and their unrealistic, rigid, and inhumane expectations, this person seals the deal. They finally do lose conscious contact with who they are. There is a severe trance and identity confusion right. brought on by the shame. What Carl Jung called is mourning the loss of the authentic self. So this person develops dysthemia, a low-grade chronic depression that ensues throughout life because this person is still, albeit unknowingly, mourning the loss of their true, most authentic, lovable selves. Because the message was, the way you are is not okay. And to a child, that is akin to death. When parents give off the signal or any caregiver gives off the message that if you don't turn out the way we want, we won't love you anymore, mm -hmm. is a declaration of war against the soul of that human being. Children can't express that. The war, it shows up later in criminality, truancy. Uh, not doing very well in school, can't hold down a job, can't keep a relationship. Right. These Addiction are all issues. these questions. Yep. All of that stuff starts showing up because that's what a person used to mitigate their circumstances. Those become ingrained, hence part of the trance. See, to break the trance means we would make that content conscious, bring it forward, and confront it so that we reduce its power to cause further pain. But until we do that, we continue to remain to act out in this false self, trying to fill up the deepening well uh, with all kinds of remedies that simply don't work, but they actually perpetuate the problem. So it's very important to understand that when a person is born into this whole idea uh, of, of not being who they are, they're being taught that they're only lovable when they're not who they are. <laughs> right. So, absolutely. Naturally, since love is very important, that means a child's got to get wing, get rid of that real self, install the false self that restores my love. Mm -hmm. Now, after doing that act for so many times, you can see where the consciousness between the true and authentic self breaks and that this other person steps in, but that person can never be the object of the development of true self-esteem because it's not a real person. It's a right. false self. Yeah, I've heard this. Uh, I use sometimes the metaphor of wearing the mask. You you see it in in mythology, even um, you know, or hell, it's in Star Wars, right? With Darth Vader, it's where, as old as dirt. Yeah, yeah, where people people <laughs> lose their connection with their authentic self, their emotional core, and they start acting like someone else because that someone else is going to get the love and attention that they need and they've been shamed into suppressing their their authentic self, their true emotional self at their core. It's hypnotizing. Mm -hmm. It's hypnotic. See, every infant, you're all, everybody's born in a post-hypnotic trance induced in early infancy. That's where all this starts. We're, 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 we're from the, the moment you come here, you are starting to develop a self. Right. Developmental interruptions occur when that self doesn't get to develop the way nature intended it to. So when there's an obstruction, in parenting, or people just simply don't know how to parent. Yeah. 
a lot of innocence too around this that people just don't mean to do this stuff, but it, but it happens, but, but it's depths are really experienced in violent, abusive, drug addicted, alcohol addicted families where mm-hmm. parental absenteeism or there's other activities that get more importance than, you know, spending time with your children or doing things that, 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 that matter to fa- familial development. And I'm again, excusing the people who are faced with the stark reality that they've got to do the work that they do to bring in the bread, to stay alive, to stay relevant, to stay current in, in, in their environments, to keep the, the, the wheels of, of, of their own economy churning while mm. delivering on the goods for their family. Some people don't have the time. So, and we've got to make that difference known. There are some people who just aren't interested. Then there's other people who are deeply interested but they're faced with stark realities. And this whole scenario behind uh, the virus has presented people with a whole host of new challenges in scheduling and, and right. family management and time management and all that stuff. So there's a lot of factors that just because of the virus have impacted how people relate and live now in, in ways they didn't expect. It's not on their plans, uh, I think, which is a great telling factor about what's really going on the suddenness of all this doesn't make sense to anybody however all part of the confusion all must get resolved with saying asking one very important question who am i at this point in time of my life who am, who is that person right what are the values how do they differ from you know, what I was raised on, what, what, what really matters to me. Uh, and let's, let's put all the other people aside. Let's just focus on who you are. Most people will find out. And when they've asked these questions before, and they're very, very important questions, I think I've said them before, but they're very relevant right now. And two of them go like this. What do I think about how I'm feeling and how do I feel about what I'm thinking? These are two very important questions in examining the examiner, in confronting and intervening in on these trans identities. Because some people don't really stop to think enough or even ask themselves, who am I at this time? You know, what do I value? What do I want? What do I need? What do I know? How do I proceed? We've got to really affirm our current position because all this craziness going on around us takes us out of ourselves, Mm -hmm. takes us out of our inner life experiences. So we don't really connect with who we are because we're busy being human doings, not human beings. No amount of doing can ever change your being. I say, I say to people, no amount of doing will ever change your being. You've got to get human. And that's where all the power is to prepare you for the doing. Go the other way. Right. I hear you. Well, we're knocking on 30 minutes already as fast as it goes. And I did want to kind of bring the conversation around to um, first, I wanted to mention that, you know, again, just to go back to the bullying concept, because even if you're raised in a relatively healthy family, psychologically, you're if you're thrown into a school or social situation where there's this hierarchy, the popular kids Very are bullying you and you become victimized in that way. And that's why I think it's so ubiquitous throughout our culture that people have undergone, the vast majority of people have undergone some kind of, it's almost like a shaming, an initiation ritual, you know, into this trance-like state, um, you know, into questioning their identity, into feeling uncomfortable about expressing who they are. And then before well, you respond, I just want to also bring it, bring this conversation around to the lockdown and then we'll let you finish it up. Um, because you had mentioned that once you uh, have been abused in this way and then you get triggered, and, and one of the abusive behaviors is this gaslighting that you you talk about where people yeah. um, pretend like everything's all right, when and then what they tell you is clearly not true. Clearly, there's some problem going on here, and this is what we get with the mainstream narrative about the lockdowns. I mean, I hear these memes going around constantly, and I'm constantly getting these in my conversations with others, like the science is settled, or the consensus of experts says that this is true. And I can post, you know, 10 or 20 or or 50 experts that disagree and say, clearly, it's not a consensus, because 
you know, because here's a bunch of experts who disagree and they, it doesn't seem to, you know, <laughs> anyway, so, well, yeah, go ahead. There's a few things going on there, but I'll, first I'll talk about your bullying part and I may have to circle over to your, uh, uh your, your other idea there, but mm -hmm. bullying, remember bullying is brought from home and uh, you're attracted kids at school will 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 be attracted to this that's not to say that schools are not a huge contributor to this stuff they are yeah they are but my point is the bullies that start this stuff it's not at school that it occurs it's the baggage of the child's own environment so to say that the schools are doing it sure or that you know you go to school and you get it there no you don't it comes from those kids family homes whoever those kids are whoever the youth are who are you know scrapping it out in the schoolyard or pitting a bunch of people against somebody mm -hmm. whatever the bullying mechanism is that is learned at home and brought to school so yes school then becomes uh you know the matrix for a shaming environment yes because these kids brought their bag of tricks with them well, and that's one of the things that in the interview comes up is that then it, it's just uh, outrageous example after example that the school administrators sort of, I won't say facilitate necessarily the behavior, but they don't really stop it. And they, they almost never stop the bullying while it's happening, but then they, as soon as the victim fights back, then it's a fight and they all get punished. You know, it's never blamed on the, on the bullying, which is interesting. Double, double shaming. Victim blaming, victim shaming uh, is very common in these yeah. situations where, you know, Johnny and Steve are scrapping it out. You know, Steve was attacked by Johnny. Steve did not solicit Johnny's attack, but Steve seems to get, you know, pulled into the toxicity of the remedy. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with him. So what is he learning? He's learning that even when I'm right, I'm going to be treated as though I'm part of the wrong. Right. Even when I try to set a boundary, even when I stand up to the bullying and I try to set a healthy boundary, then you're still going to get your own shamed defense. and punished. Yeah. You're, yeah. Okay. So, so this is, this is double jeopardy to me in, in the abuse uh, cycle of things, the abuse matrix, you know, there's this control wheel we have, we talk about control, right? And teachers are all over that wheel. Let's be yeah. clear. Many teachers don't understand nor are they trained enough to understand how to manage uh, a, a bully situation with kids. A kid who is probably being bullied for a while is somehow made out to be a part of the problem. And this is very frustrating for a victim. Mm -hmm. Very frustrating. Oh, yeah. They're utterly innocent. They have not contributed to the problem. This bully is trying to have their way because this bully feels as though he can have his way with this weak link, this wimpy guy that he thinks he's superior to. It's really the bully who's the wimp. However, he's intimidating enough. And yet the school or the teacher or whoever is in charge of analyzing this stuff puts it all in the wrong place. They totally see the bully as, uh, oh, sorry, the, uh, the victim as somehow you know causing things to be the way they are mm -hmm. it's not that's not always the case in fact oftentimes it's not the case uh that that kids are going through this stuff in school again when these bullies are going to school they're bringing what they have learned and in my opinion it's up to the school to learn about what the dynamics of bullying are how to properly name them and how to bring it to the attention of the parents who are the original training ground for the bully and make sure that it doesn't happen again and stop this person from interrupting the innocent people from learning because that's what they're doing. They're, they're causing stress on these students and they don't learn properly right? because they're worried about their safety. Children can't learn unless it's safe. It's got to be absolutely safe at all times. And bullies need help. They don't need to be punished. They need help. They need to get it that they are coming from an environment where this is learned behavior. And they are now putting innocent kids in the help in the same helpless position. They are assuming 
The problem with the bully is his strife and his frustration about being treated like that at home is forbidden in its expression to his offenders. Mm -hmm. So he takes it out on the innocent chumps at school where it can have a life of its own. That's what we're dealing with. Well, and then this is what it feels like when I get into these political conversations and my perspective is outside of the mainstream narrative. And, you know, so maybe we could tie it around to the gaslighting of the mainstream media and some of these memes that people throw in your face that are designed to just shut down conversation, even when they're clearly not true, even when the science is not settled. And then this bullying behavior really seems to come out. Like when somebody is triggered because you're presenting information that's outside of that narrative, that's uh, outside of the identity that this person has taken on, that the authority is telling them is the identity that is the correct identity. Um, yes. Then, um, then they come across to me as, as bullying. I mean, I get people like, uh, you know, they're not, I mean, the yelling, the shaming, it comes across on social media, you know, just the personal attacks, uh, when I'm trying to just bring up, uh, again, alternative information from experts and scientists that don't fit in with the, with the mainstream narrative. Exactly. So, all right, we're um, probably looking at uh, over 30 minutes now, and we might as well wrap it up. But, I mean, that, it's cool to be able to see where these characteristics really start to come across in the conversations that we're having. And uh, I was stoked that I could have that bullying conversation because I think it helps to tie it all in. I think so many of us have been victimized uh, by the bullies in the, in the social hierarchy that is just – ubiquitous we're seeing it right now we're we're exactly in toronto canada right now people protesters have been attacked by police assaulted by police media have been ill-treated and treated like you know non-essential all of a sudden Mm -hmm. we're seeing rights being trampled on by bullies absolutely very mystifying stuff it's very interesting how in the material that we're examining It shows up. And this isn't the only way to explain this stuff. Mystification is definitely a great destination for this information because in one place we can find all the characteristics people are feeling today and dealing with today. And when we're seeing violence back in our world, that is extremely mystifying. Mm -hmm. Nothing puts people to sleep faster than traumatizing them. And that is what put people who I call adult children, asleep in the first place. That's where the identity trance confusion came from initially. If we're going to return to those values as necessary, we're simply putting everyone back to sleep. Right. Yeah, it's just been amazing. And even when the authorities are the ones perpetrating the violence, then still so many others in our communities will justify their violence. Um, You know, I get called a fascist. Talk about projection. I get called a fascist when I advocate these days for freedom of speech, for the right of assembly. You know, when I question that uh, uh, emergency state of emergency should allow a, a government to a governor to take over the legislative process because I believe in democracy. You know? it's, 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 it's a fascinating it's total, time to be alive. <laughs> it is. It's total projection. I mean, you cannot use ridicule to eliminate the truth. You cannot use scorn yeah. or any other form of controlling, you know, ridicule, shaming, blaming kinds of behavior. That doesn't get rid of truth. It only express. it's actually a real expression of, how desperate its user is, how desperately they don't want to accept the truth right? by tagging you with all of those dysfunctional ways of interpersonally relating. Those are interpersonal deficits. You're not relating. (laughs) We said before, whether it's attacking skills or lacking, and they are clearly lacking. Yeah. Here's the conversation going. What are you doing for your family and to make sure they understand what's really happening in their worlds today. What are you doing for your children and your youth? These are very important questions for their future. And it's our jobs as parents to train them. And it's our jobs to make sure that we are in 
the condition, a strong enough educated position and condition to lead our children in those directions. Right. And when people are not furnished with that kind of knowledge, dysfunction, discord is the order of the day. Let's uh, let's ask one final question because I'm just um, you know in my own personal experience, like how do you deal with someone? Okay, one more. I, I've started to yeah, <laughs> I've started to uh, be able to recognize when people get triggered when you're talking to them and they come back with you know oh this is crazy your ideas are just you're a nut job yada yada and you know they've been they've been triggered. I, I think the first thing to do is not get triggered yourself. So if you're responding in anger. And going back and forth, that's just a, a worthless conversation. But so how do you respond to someone who's been triggered? Uh, do you try to have compassion? Do you try to, or do you end okay, the conversation? Well, well, is it even worse? Go, is, is it worth continuing on? Well, hang on a sec. If somebody, okay, if you're saying that when somebody's attacking you, is that what you want me to respond to? Sure. I mean, you know, the the verbal cues when when it's an ad hominem attack or or they're not paying attention to they're you know, they're clearly not listening to what you're saying and they're coming back with aggressive language or passive aggressive behavior. Okay, so, you know, when people are telling you you're an idiot or you're a POS and you know all the the labels and and usuals mm -hmm. uh, at the table, uh really what you're dealing with is projection. When somebody says you're a duck, I mean, believe me, you can find their feathers very, right. very quickly. Uh, I think the best way to handle it when people, if if somebody is, you know, haphazardly going off on you, being rude and arrogant and attacking your being, uh, certainly you could say, I'm not comfortable with that. Please, you know. Right. Stop. Set some boundaries. Right? Yeah. If they, absolutely. If they can, if they continue uh, where you hold all the powers, you say, I told you already, I don't like that, and walk away. Yeah. There's no point in pursuing a conversation with them. Sure. Uh, you've got to maintain your, your own safety and your own self-respect. Now, I'm not saying don't, you know, don't be afraid to give them your anger if it gets to a point where, you know, the threat level increases. Don't be afraid to know when to call on that anger. It's your life, uh, protective energy and your strength. Uh, but no that your anger works for you. You've got to keep it in check. Don't do anything destructive. Like don't hurt somebody, including yourself. Unless of course your physical integrity is in question, then defend yourself come what may uh, as necessary. But I think we've got to use as in every situation, whether it's physical or verbal, reasonable force, reasonable force, whether it's verbal or physical, we start off preferably with the verbal. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're in a situation where you can't get away from the person, it's hard sometimes. I mean, we all lose it. As I say, people will lose it when they say lose it. I've lost control is what they're really saying. I've done it. We've all done it. Uh, uh, I think it's important that people accept that everybody's human, that, you know, we can lose our, you know what, sometimes what's well, a big deal. Just own it and move on. Uh, some people deserve it. Other times they don't. If they don't own it, apologize, move on. But well, I think when people are attacking you, it's very important to have the skill to be able to say, not happy with that. Not for me. Wrong person. I'm out of here. Goodbye. I'm not speaking to you. Yeah. It's important to just be able to let the person know that you decide how they treat you. They don't. Sounds like a plan. Great advice, actually. So thank you so much, George, for joining Thanks, us man. again, having this conversation about identity trance awesome. and confusion. What, uh, what's going to be the yeah. topic for next week? Well, we're going to head into w one of the, you know, precursors to mystification, which is, which is called cognitive closure. This okay. precedes cognitive dissonance. See, the cognitively closed would not let the information in, so they're all too shocked when they hear it. Hence right. dissonance. Right. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. You want to let people know where to get in touch? At the Line Media Twitter, at the Line Canada Twitter, the Line Canada Instagram. And hey, I'm always open to a good debate. If anything I've said here challenges your thinking, email me at media at the line international .com. Check us out on the Line Canada, www.thelinecanada.com.
All right. Sounds good. Thanks again, George. And uh, I will just let people know they've been listening to the Psychology of Lockdown series. This has been the eighth installment. I'm your host, Doug McKenty, uh, and I produce the uh, weekly long form interview podcast called The Shift, where you can find all of that, uh, all of my podcasts, hundreds of hours of free content. Sign up for the newsletter uh, and think about subscribing to the show. Six bucks a month for, for the full length interviews uh, really helps out a lot. Uh, gives me the freedom to be able to do this full time. And you can find that at www.theshiftnow.com. I'm also on YouTube and Twitter at The Shift with Doug uh, and U- YouTube and Facebook at The Shift with Doug McKinty, and I am on Twitter at the McKinty. I'm also on uh, Gab, Float, uh, Minds, Truth, and a variety of other social media sites. Uh, I have been expanding my reach, and I have a Telegram channel as well that I'm urging people to go on. That's actually been a pretty good way to converse, uh, and that you can find under The Shift with Doug McKinty. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks uh, again, George, and we'll do it again next week. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me. You bet. Have a great day. You as well. Take care, everybody.